Support Wrestle Talk. Give us a subscribe. The battle lines were drawn. NXT, TNA. Not as much from TNA. It was really just one match. But what a match. In fact, we're going to lead with that match because it's the most interesting thing to talk about on this show. And the thing I'm most wanting to talk about on yeah. this show as well because goddamn Jordan Grace is fantastic. Welcome to the Wrestle Talk podcast review of NXT Battleground 2024. I am Tempest. That is the truth, Dan Layton. This is, of course, replacing. This is our, our weekend wrestling yeah. update. Because this is a... the big thing that happened other than Tate Mayfair showing up on a collision yeah whenever there's a there's a, a weekend show like with the weekend update show yeah and this is this is the big the biggest show from the weekend although we will shout out some stuff that happened over the weekend shout elsewhere. out to dominion and also el desperado's weird renegade show that he is booking and airing like right now as we're recording it yeah. it's the craziest wrestling show of the year i didn't know it was happening but i can't stop thinking about it Great. Well, I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk about that in a minute. Okay. I feel like we should. I feel like the, the weekend update should feature some stuff <laughs> from the weekend. But uh, the, yes, the very much leading part of it is Battleground, which was a good show. I thought it was a, it was an entertaining show, very much. Um, some some matches I thought were fantastic mm -hmm. showcases of what NXT should be, i.e. elevating new talent. Others were a bit like, oh, that was odd. I, you made an interesting choice there. But I had a good time with it. Um, and the... the uh, yeah, the... That said, there's not loads, it's not like a driving thing coming from it to talk about that's going to carry us into the next phase, except for this kind of interesting, it still feels quite fresh because it is only two weeks old, NXT NA crossover. Mm -hmm. Crossover doing a lot of heavy lifting of the word so far. Well, that's it. Because this... You know, we could talk about, like, what is TNA getting out of it? Because it hasn't been ratings. That's been apparent. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there hasn't been the, the WWE folk going back the other way. And we could talk about this and that. But what this has built to thus far has been this show. Mm. And what have they gotten out of it thus far with the match of Jordan Grace versus Roxanne Perez? Mm. That's sort of what we're looking to talk about here and now. Yeah. And maybe look at what that could lead to in the future, but how they managed to pay off the early goings of this little crossover event, mm. this comic book crossover spin-off series that we're getting here in the the summer months. I think of a uh, uh, thesaurus word for forbidden. The the prohibited the prohibited portal has been yes. opened. Um, yeah, so let's get into it because the the. the the match obviously was Roxanne Perez versus Jordan Grace. Uh, Jordan Grace had popped up on NXT. She was in the Royal Rumble, popped up on NXT a couple of weeks ago to say, hello, I'm challenging you. Hello, um, I'm great. And it was all kept very under wraps. I think in the rehearsals, it was like written yeah. down as Tegan Knox and Lita's music was used or whatever to sort of keep the secret, which is I'm all for keeping secrets. Very effective. So yeah, it's been a two week build. Jordan Grace had a match on um, NXT TV last week that was very impressive. She looked great, obviously, because she is. And then we get into this moment where, you know, out she's coming in front i like white gear she's in white gear roxanne's in some sick gear as well there's this sort of champion versus champion vic even references you know booker this is a really interesting match for you you are a former tna champion you are a champion in wwe booker talks about roxanne and his history with roxanne and, and you know how fascinating this is as a sort of moment it has a cool energy that they feel each other out for a little bit until Roxanne slaps Grace around the face, which makes her snap and hit some power moves. Uh, and Roxanne gets a thumb in the eye. Um, and then it is sort of in control for a minute, attacking Grace's shoulder, removing some of the power is what she's going to do. Um, Roxanne's cross body off the top rope is reversed into a world stronger slam. Grace goes for the Grace under pressure, Vader bomb thingy. Um, and misses they they sort of it's a struggle it's kind of like this idea of like they're both champions they're both trying to take advantage where they can and neither of them is able to fully get into it until grace manages to win out and hit a sort of torture rack bomb situation off the top rope for a two um i like that the fact that they're just kind of reversing each other they're not able to fully connect with their moves so they're just trying to weaken each other roxanne's really going for the submission or like the stretching the shoulder and grace is going for like strikes and, and power moves um we end up with Grace hitting a muscle buster for a near fall, which is pretty tasty. Um, but the, then the, the sort of big finish of the match, Tatum Paxley, who has been um, weird. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good word for it. For a while. I knew several girls like her in sixth form. She pops over the um, 
the barricade and she's eyeing up the championship, which has been her thing. She, you know, she's a bit of a magpie. She likes gold. She loves gold. Thank you so much. I was so close to doing it. I'm so glad you did. Um, but she ends up not going for the NXT Women's Championship. I, I assume because it's not so much gold as it is uh, rainbow. Mm -hmm. There is much more gold to be found on the Impact Knockout, the TNA Knockouts Championship, which she picks up and heads to the aisle in the UFC Apex Arena. Where she is met by Dinner Bro. Oh, no. uh, 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 Ash by Elegance, formerly known as Dana Brooke in NXT, um, who sort of knocks her down. And then Jordan Grace comes out, is kind of annoyed at them both, knocks them both down with her championship, heads back into the ring uh, where she goes for the juggernaut. But in something that I watched about three times because it's just so good. Perez seamlessly reverses into a cutter situation and then hits the Pop Rocks and gets the win, retaining her championship. Um, and leaving the prohibited portal open for a, a, a few different combinations, I think, especially in the women's division. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of been the focus of all this. There's been teases of Brooks Jensen going to TNA or, you Massive. know... People saying, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if it was Axiom or Nathan Frazier posted a thing, just be like, we'll defend these tag titles against anyone, anywhere, kind of leaving that door open for maybe some TNA folk to come through. I'd like to see the Anthem Bullet Club, the ABCs come through, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But regardless, I have a lot of thoughts about this match. First of all, I thought Jordan Grace was by far the best worker on this show. I agreed. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, like, fantastic. Mm -hmm. An absolute, perfectly well-rounded performer. In a perfect world, she'd be wrestling in major arenas to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. But she looks like she could just walk into that slot. Like, like she did at the Royal Rumble. She yeah. walked in and it was just like, okay, you, you're kind of... In the same way that Jay Cargill has the aura, just Jordan has the work to match it already. Yes. She's got a certain intensity yeah. about her that... You don't typically see from performance center graduates. I know yeah. what you mean. Like, maybe not graduates, like, oh, people that made the main roster, whatever. But there's a different level of intensity between someone who's really, like, their technique is just so snug and they're able to work this really intense, tight style compared to someone who's learning and is in the PC mm -hmm. or on NXT regularly right now. So that, that's my first thought. Jordan Grace, good. Newsflash. Uh... <laughs> Part two of that, of course, Roxanne Perez, also good. Very good. I've been singing Roxanne Perez's praises ever since I was reviewing NXT. You know, I I think she would be like in the upper tier of main roster women's wrestlers right now. And they could have really done something interesting if they wanted to go like, oh, youngest ever champion type thing. Because mm. she's been ready since she showed up. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, Ring of Honor, women's champion and everything. She's fantastic. Love that. This was the match I was most looking forward to on the show. Because you look up and down, and there's some other like interesting matches and matches that I think either you know over delivered or delivered what you thought and was also fantastic. But this was the match where I saw two people on the other side where I was like, this should be really, really good. And I think for about 95% of it, it was. The only 5% being whatever the hell was going on with this finish. Yes. And it was just a little bit clunky for me in that I understand that when you do a crossover, cross-promotional match, either you're going to have a match where you pretty much know the outcome going in, mm -hmm. or there's got to be shenanigans mm -hmm. to keep the person from the other company looking strong. Yeah. What we got here was... The latter. Mm -hmm. You didn't have, like, immediately going... In, like, if Roxanne Perez just lost clean to Jordan Grace and lost the NXT Women's title, that'd be like, wow, they're really going for it. I didn't expect that. But similarly, if Jordan Grace just gets beaten clean on an NXT show, I don't know what that does for TNA yeah. or whatever. It's a political game. However, I don't know what this, <laughs> this finish was. Like, Tatum Paxley's got this character she's doing, and that's fine. And Dana Brooke, Ash by Elegance, coming out to either thwart or get involved with whatever Tatum Paxley was doing, and that being the distraction that led to Jordan Grace getting, be getting beaten, it... 
I wish that people could just get beat and it wouldn't be a political thing. I wish you could yeah. just do a match and one person's better and that's fine. I get that's not how it works, but it did cheapen sort of the whole experience for me just a little bit, mm. seeing that be how it ended. Because I'm sorry, I care about Roxanne Perez and I care about Jordan Grace a lot. I don't care about Tatum Paxley's weird character and I don't care about Dana Brooke returning to the yeah. NXT Performance Center zone. Right. What's Hash by Elegance doing in the yeah, yeah right? It's if if somebody else showed up that was like tippy top name from from Impact or something, mm. maybe I'd feel different. Like I don't know, I can't think of an example off the top of my head that would have you know been a, a better replacement for this. But I went into this and I went through ninety five percent of this match going. This should have been the main event. Mm -hmm. By the end of it, I was like, I don't think you could put that in the main event with that finish. That's sort of how I came out of it looking, and it was a bit disappointing. I know exactly what you mean, and I can completely see that. I, especially, I think, coming off the ta the triple threat, which had interference as well, two matches with interference in a row feels a bit clunky is exactly it. I also think there's something about the clunkiness of it happening in the entrance way. Uh, it's the close of the match. It's got to be quite quick. You've got to get past you got to get in there was something where to your point about jordan's style and that tightness and that power and all of that there was something uh looser and sloppier about mm -hmm. you know not only ash doing what she was doing but then jordan doing it as well and then on ash as well um on, on a purely work level it looked a little bit baggy um i'm far more inclined to give it a little bit of no pun intended grace because i think the reason I keep bringing up the fact that this has only been happening for two weeks is that this really showed me, okay, this is going to be a continuing partnership. Sure. There, this is likely to see, and actually it would be very smart if the NXT is intended to be a developmental brand to send you to a different location because they always talk about the leap up to the main roster is different. Now, I'm not saying going to TNA is going to give you that WWE main roster experience, but it's going to give you an experience outside the performance center. Mm -hmm. So sending a Tatum Paxley, sending a Kalani Jordan, sending a, not, not uh, uh, some of these, the performance center is a fascinating place. Some people come in and they have decades of experience. Some people come in and they've never touched a, a ring rope before in their life. So, it's all about, I think, developing the talent, and this is a great opportunity to do it. I actually, you know, this is not it, it, none of this critique of it didn't necessarily land the Dana Pop return, the Dana Pop, the, the the Dana Brooke return pop didn't pay off or whatever. It was a second before I realized who it was. None of that is against Dana Brooke, who is someone who I've said a number of times I've got a, a great deal of respect for for purely work ethic and the if you it, it, listen to anyone in. Uh, the WWE ecosystem, they will tell you that she was one of the first people to show up, one of the last people to leave. She was always trying to get better. Um, and I was really, I thought TNA was a really great shout for her to pop up and do a, a, something a bit different. Because um, I, I never really saw her going to AEW, for instance. Sure. Um, so it was kind of nice for her to have a sort of moment like that. And it's nice for her to be involved in this in some way. I think they never really figured out what Dana Brooke was. She was about three or four different things. And as a result, the fans never really were able to connect with her. So I think expecting her to get a big, whoa, pop is not on the cards. I don't think that's necessarily what they intended to do. So the selling of Vic Joseph on that front, the, you know, wasn't he an aide? Oh, oh, oh. And people thinking Vic Joseph slips. He's, he's, he's kind of cornered the market in that on purpose slip. Uh -huh. Um, which kind of gives it a, again, a little moment. And really this all feels to me like it's, it's the beginning of a partnership rather than the peak of it, which is why I'm a little bit less on the, um, I suppose, cross about the way it went down mm -hmm. or, or disappointed in the way it went down. I think it's fair to say you are. Yeah, I think that's it. Like, if I'm taking a step back and looking at it in a broad sense, I think it's fine to leave the door open for various other things in the future. But if I'm reviewing a match mm. in a vacuum... Yeah, I can't look at the closing sequence as anything but making the match worse. No, I know what you mean. And so you're in a weird kind of position where, again, I'm the guy who likes the wrestling match portion of it. That's the thing that I'm going to tune in for and the thing I care most about. So when I see the match that I'm most looking forward to on the show have a really whack-ass finish, <laughs> I'm going to be like, all right, whatever. But, also, but I do point, understand that there's a bigger picture to that. But, you know? to, but to your point, though, there is a way to do that um, that's, that's more effective. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's, you know... 
doing something in the ring and making it look more effective. I think that could, because it's a fair critique that you're making. I think if, if it was executed more effectively, I think you would mind less. Probably. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of it. Where do you see, uh, do, I mean, do you see there, first of all, do you see there being a, a, a Perez Grace 2? Do you see it going differently? Um, I could see it going differently in the sense that, you know, maybe they do the second match on a TNA pay-per-view and Jordan Grace wins there. Mm -hmm. That seems to, you know, I wrestled for your belt. Now you give me a shot for your belt. And like and a finale at like a, a... Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. I think I think that works out nicely. I, I Judging by the work itself, I'd like to see the match again, mm. you know. I think it's I think it's a fair assumption to make that we're not done here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we are now going to pivot and go in a direction of well Jordan Grace is going to focus on Tatum Paxley and that's her, you know, prohibited portal whatever. That's her direction now going forward or whether that's like the little TV feud in between like well Roxanne Perez I'm not forgetting about you I almost won that championship and I won't rest until I get another shot at it I don't know if that's the big picture mm. or if this now this new thing is now the new big picture and we could have Ash by elegance facing Roxanne Perez at the next NXT show I don't know if we are now introducing two new directions for both of them or something for both of them to do before they come back together mm. i know which one i would prefer it's it's the latter i want to see roxanne and jordan grace wrestle again mm -hmm. but i wouldn't be surprised if it went the other way too how do you feel about this partnership this nxtna thing uh... what, are you, what are your, your take on it because from, from my perspective it's not one of those things where I'm like, this is game changing for the industry. I think it was cool the second sure. it first happened. And I think it also being on the show where we had an uh, Ethan Page debut was quite a, it, it felt like quite a big talking point for that week. Um, I, I don't necessarily think it's like game changing for TNA or NXT, but I think it's a really effective partnership for what NXT is supposed to be, if that makes sense. Yes, I think uh, you brought up the idea of like sending NXT Performance Center talent to TNA for, you know, an excursion to steal a phrase from New Japan. I think that is a fantastic idea. I've always been someone saying that the idea of just wrestling in a warehouse mm. is an abhorrent way <laughs> to get people to the point where they're going to be main roster ready and able to wrestle all these different styles. Granted, it has helped that, you know, we went through a real dip in the beginning era of the 2.0 deal mm -hmm. where there weren't a lot of te like top level talents coming in. You know, it was mostly the holdovers from original NXT and then all the new wacky characters that they were trying to bring up. It was a really weird kind of balance there. But there wasn't a lot of meshing of styles. You were seeing a lot of the different styled wrestlers leave or continue to have that beaten out of them, as was the style at the time. But now you've seen people like Ilya Dragunov's coming in. Mm -hmm. He's been there for a while, obviously. He's now on the main roster. But like he's got a very different style compared to all the other people that are still showing up now in, in NXT. That being said, that only takes you so far... Because it's not only styles, it's different environments. Mm -hmm. It's people that aren't going to every single show, that know your moves every single time. You need to go and wrestle in front of people that have never seen you before in person. Maybe know your name and obviously what you're doing. But you go to the impact zone and you're wrestling in front of new eyeballs. And that experience is very useful. And you'll just wrestle more people that you wouldn't get to wrestle otherwise. So I've always been a big fan, big proponent of that happening. I think to make this whole thing uh, work, I don't know if it needs to be the focus of both shows. Like, oh my god, here is the WWE contingent. They've yeah. all in invaded or anything like that. I don't think you need to go that far. But... It needs to inject both shows with a little bit of life. I feel like that's what it did the first time when Jordan Grace showed up. Mm -hmm. Everybody was like, wow, NXT last night actually had some stuff on it. That, that sort of feeling, I want to be prevalent through all of these shows. And I think it's as simple as, like, I saw people over the, over the weekend saying that 
Leon Slater is really grabbing a lot of attention from people in NXT right now because, you know, we know Leon Slater. He's a UK indie guy. He's fantastic. He's got the best 450 splash in the game. If you sent Javon Evans, who I haven't gotten to talk about on a podcast, but is absolutely going to be a goddamn megastar at some point. If you send those two over to TNA and they have a match, that's the talking point of the weekend. Mm -hmm. That's people going like, wow, you see what happened on TNA? You need something like that. And it might be as simple as sending Cedric Alexander across to have a match with Mustafa Ali. Right. You know? It might just be that simple. It doesn't need to be this large, overarching, storyline invasion thing. Yeah. It just needs to feel alive. It needs to feel like, ooh, it's really fun to tune into TNA and not know what you're going to expect. Or the same thing with NXT. And I think it's possible. It's just how much do they want to commit to being able to do that. Yeah. I would lean further into it, but that's that's just me. I, I, I'm completely with you. I think there's no need for an invasion storyline or, or a Team NXT versus Team TNA situation i think i think that would be a little bit trite a little bit rote um whereas this is like uh, uh already i mean you've listed two or three matches there that i really want to see mm-hmm. i love the idea of we've got a new women's mid card title off you go over to tna and, and defend sure. it there off you go um you know the, the women's tag titles which in theory should be allowed to be defended on nxt aren't going to be defended in tna but like Elsewhere, you've, like as you said, the tag titles. There's a few people you want to go over there. I'm thinking of like Oba Femi versus like Josh Alexander or whatever. Sure, sounds fun. Like a, a few combinations of matches where it would be entertaining in a competitive element without it being a brand warfare invasion thing. Which yeah, I feel like because the invasion didn't work in 2001 <laughs> for a lot of people. Everyone's been desperate to force it ever since. Yeah. Um, whether it be Nexus or, you know, Brand Warfare Raw Smackdown. Or um, AEW TNA. Or, yeah, literally. So, um, you know, I, I think I think it's a good... Um, I think it's in very early stages. I think it's pretty uh, interesting to see where it's going to go from there. Um, should we get into the main show? Let's. Um, but before then... Uh, is there anything from, in the spirit of weekend? <laughs> I want to like shout out. So SmackDown for the past couple of weeks, we weren't able to do one last week because you were poorly. Um, that was very sick. Somehow I managed to get con flu from the UKG <laughs> without going. <laughs> it do it do be like that sometimes. So you not only do you get FOMO, you also got con flu. Um, but we so we didn't get to talk about the AJ Styles retirement segment, which I thought was uh, delightfully. Uh, effective and you know self-referential and meta and all that stuff um and the follow-on on on raw on sorry on smackdown this past weekend was also really good Mm -hmm. i thought uh the the choice to turn it into an i quit match and cody's line about um you should have said those words last week so i'm gonna make you say them i don't like i quit matches i it's one of that and last man standing are two of my least favorite um stipulations but um on the basis of their performance over the past couple weeks and their backlash match i'm interested to see what you do so, here's my my take on I Quit matches are that I actually really like I Quit matches. I think it's just the microphone when, in the mouth where they're going. Oh, oh, well, yeah, oh. there's that. I don't like jo- I don't like I Quit matches that had John Cena in them. <laughs> okay, fair, yeah. With the exception of the first two, the one against JBL was really good because holy god, John Cena bled a bucket, and the the first one he had with Randy Orton mm. because that. That Randy Orton match was the match that established the I'd never give up, I'd never say die, I will never quit John Cena. It was that match. Like, that's really the start of never never give up John Cena. Mm-hmm. After that, every single one of those matches is the goddamn same. The one he had with Batista, The Miz, Rusev, they all sucked. No time for any of that. I quit matches otherwise, I think are really good. Mm. Because it's like, it's sort of a submission match, but people never go that hard in a submission match. Whereas I quit matches, if you really want to, you know, go ham, you can go and make it really violent and cool. Like you either saw with, you know, Adam Copeland, Christian Cage on Dynamite this year, or Chavo Guerrero and Rey Mysterio had a good one in 2006 that I thought was really cool. You know, there have been really good ones. Of course, Ric Flair and Terry Funk. I'm going to forget the best one ever. But... As a stipulation, it was attached to John Cena, who was the least interesting person to ever see in an I Quit match. And I think that, like, decade run of bad I Quit matches really tainted Mm -hmm. this gimmick for 
every other person to come along, and now we're seeing it come back up. So I'm really looking forward to the match. I think AJ Styles is doing the most interesting work that he's done now in a very long time. Yeah. I said after WrestleMania I really wanted him to come in and just reignite the spark. Give me a main event AJ Styles run that I felt like I hadn't seen in ages and ages and ages. And he had a great match with Cody Rhodes, but at the time it kind of seemed like, oh, one and done. Yep. Cody moves on to a new challenger. To loop that back in, give AJ a big segment and then another title match, I'm like, okay, now we've got like a proper rivalry for Cody coming out of WrestleMania. will probably culminate before SummerSlam. Mm -hmm. Might not. They mm -hmm. might do a blow off at SummerSlam. I feel like that is exactly what I have been missing from AJ Styles since. So I've been a big fan of what he's been doing the last few weeks. Otherwise, quick few shout-outs to give for pro wrestling in general. Dominion was this past week in New Japan. It means we're getting John Moxley and Tetsuya Naito. John Moxley is not going to lose that title at Forbidden Door. Evil should not be on the show at all. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Cobb retained his title and has said that he's opening a challenge for anybody in AEW to face him for the New Japan TV title. And I will be upset if it's anyone but Samoa Joe mm -hmm. because that match is just, oh, I want to see that. Jeff Cobb, Samoa Joe, that's fantastic. Orange Cassidy and Zack Sabre Jr. are having their first singles match. Orange Bollocks, ha ha ha, it's going to be fantastic. Forbidden Doors, the cards coming together. Tate Mayfair's was on a collision. Yeah. That's just that's nutty. Right. Yeah. Very happy to see that. That's cool. And yeah, El Desperado is the booker of the year. <laughs> I didn't have it on my bingo card, but they chanted at Minoru Suzuki to take his boots off so he could walk across Lego and then he did it. And I was yeah. like, well, this is the best show I've seen all year. Yeah. Um, and a shout out to Pro Wrestling Eve as well, who had a big show over the weekend. And yeah. Uh, it's, it's been all over my socials. So I just want to give them a little, uh, little thumbs up. Um, uh, let's get into the show. So um, we had a, our introduction from our host, Sexy Red. Host is a strong word. She, uh, she had four segments and went home. Um, and honestly, a trip to Vegas is fun. Get yourself paid, whatever. Here in this introduction, she says, welcome to Battle Round. Does some twerking. And I can feel the wrinkles forming in my face. I'm so old. I don't know who this person is, but apparently they're a big deal. Um, that's my age. And we are in the UFC Apex, which looks cozy. It looks exactly like the Performance yeah. Center NXT arena. They had really hyped this as a special thing. And I... Ha I I didn't really feel a difference, and actually, I felt like the performance center is better. I thought it was the performance center when I saw it. Right. It it's identical. I cannot put over enough how much these two they dress them up exactly the same, the same entranceway, the same screens, the same setup of all the seats. It could not have looked more identical. Yeah. Um. Anyway, the first match of the night was the women's North American title ladder match to crown the very first women's North American champion. It was uh, Jada Parker, Michin, Fallon Henley, Lash Legend, Kalani Jordan, and um, someone who I uh, have coined Sol Rukashay. That's very good. Thank you very much. Um, Lash Legend and Jordan sort of kick things off together while everyone goes outside and Booker T gets taken out by a ladder. Uh -huh. um, it, I don't know what happened. I think he just got hit in the face when Jada's setting up a little ladder bridge. It's about on you. Um... Lash Legend, stop it. <laughs> Lash Legend shows off some uh, sort of strength in the ring. Um, it's kind of showcasing what everyone has. Lash's power. Kylie Jordan does a big sort of spinning plancher. Sol Ruka does a, a little step up moonsault onto the outside. Um, and they, they end up going into, into the ring. There's a, there's a back and forth between Lash and Meechin that ends with Lash trapping Meechin in a sleeper and sort of putting all of her power and strength into it. Then Fallon climbs on Lash's back to lock in a sleep of her own. Kalani on her back. So you've kind of got a four stacked tower mm -hmm. sleeper hold, which uh, Lash then just decides to drop Meechan and climb the ladder with those two on her back, which is sick. But the crowd didn't even say anything about it, which was weird. Um, it's a quiet crowd they anyway. were They were back and forth because there were moments where they were really up for it and really in it. But then something about the venue made me just see an awful lot of them just sort of sat there like this. Well, half of them were UFC fighters, as it turned out. Well, right, yeah. Um, so, yeah, very odd venue altogether, yeah. I thought. But uh, um, when when we do get to the top of the ladder, uh, Kalani is kind of on top of it, while Jada and Lash are stretching her over it, which looked gross, and I was a big fan it of it. It was a cool spot. It was. Uh, we went into a sort of climby, climby, pull-down segment where everyone is hopping up the ladder and, and coming down. Uh, in the end, uh, Sol Rooker and Lash Legend are on top of the ladder 
uh, Ruka goes for a sort of sunset flip that doesn't work. Lash is too strong. So all of the other women combine to get her above their heads and launch her off the top, over the top rope where she promptly bounces off the ladder bridge that's set up outside. And that is the last we'll see of Lash in this match. And I do not blame her. Looked pretty vicious. I made the most guttural noise. You really did. And I was like, the ladder spot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, back in the ring, Meechan hits a lovely DDT where she kind of like stepped upon Jada to get some leverage of her, but she gets pushed to the outside. Jada Parker takes advantage, but Soul Rooker is there to hit the Soul Snatcher, which is so sick. It's just so good, and it fully comes out of nowhere. Move. And I love it. And what I, what I love about it is specifically that it is very momentum heavy. It's flashy, but it makes sense to me. Yeah. It's not one of those where it feels like the the move that you do before the move is there to make the crowd go, ooh, it feels like... Yeah, Byron like... Saxon's finisher. What was Byron Saxon's finisher? Uh, you, I'll show it to you after. Okay, it's the first thing that type comes up on YouTube if you type in Byron Saxton because it's the worst finisher of all time with right. lots of flourish yeah. before just a slam. Create a finisher. Yes, yeah. Whereas absolutely. this one feels like it's about if I, if I get this momentum and I use my speed, I can use all of that power to pull you to the ground and make your head splat into the canvas. And it does. And so like Vic Joseph has a big scream on commentary, which is exactly how I'd react because it comes out of nowhere. Um, there's a little scramble, uh, but Jordan manages to connect with a high kick and a split leg moon to Alder Meechian on a prone ladder and then just scamps up and retrieves the title. Yeah. Which felt like a quick ending yeah it so i had a lot of thoughts about this match first of all my ass was clenched the entire time right just like mm, don't get hurt don't get hurt yeah. don't get hurt because you know it's a bunch of performance center folk in a ladder match mm -hmm. which mm, and is even scary with, um, even with meech in there being the sort of like main roster it's only one of her there's only one of her and she's not necessarily been in a bunch of these matches either no you know so i was worried but they pulled it off. Mm. I thought this ladder match was fine. There were some really cool bits. I really like Sol Ruka and her in particular her finisher. But there's still some things like when she did her step up moonsault to the outside thing at the beginning of the match, like she did her moonsault and her knees were up, and I thought like she was gonna kill. I think Lash was who she landed on. But that being said, everybody seems to have come out of this okay. Yeah. Which, no you know, injuries. I will give Credit where credit is due. The biggest thing when it comes to these sort of matches is can we agent this match in a way where no one gets hurt? Mm -hmm. And it seems that that's how they did it. So, fair play to that. The finish, to me, felt like... like This wasn't one of those uh, ladder matches where like you tell a story mm -hmm. or anything. Most ladder matches at this point, I don't think, really fall in that category anyway. But it was just like, okay, we're going to do... A series of spots, but then it just ended. Yeah. You know, it's not like, we did the biggest spot, and now the ring is clear. Look around. No one to stop me. Go up. Grab the belt. Build you to that height, that crescendo, and, you know. Yeah. It was just, and now we hit a move. Oh, it's over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Especially when it, the, the moving question was split leg moonsault looked good, was yeah. well executed on the ladder, taken well. Uh, it just was one that I see quite regularly sometimes. Yeah. So it's like, it didn't feel like a big match ending moment i liked the match i thought it was good i think um to your point it's not a storytelling match necessarily because it's to crown a new champion mm -hmm. so you can tell stories going into that if you want to but really and i think the the, the victor of this as well i think kalani jordan's a really good choice for it because she's someone who's like nowhere near the main title scene but sh that shouldn't stop her from getting the experience of being a, a, a figurehead and knowing what it's like to be a defending champion again mm -hmm. it's a development division it should there should be space for that, especially with a division that is full in the way that this is. I thought Fallon Henley looked a star coming out with her big coat and this new sort of new gear. She's got this new attitude. I love Lash Legend. Uh, I, I, I'm a big Meechin fan as well. It's nice mm -hmm. to see her, let, like, let her be her, you know, kind of thing. So, and yeah, like you say, Sol Rooker. Jada Park is the only one where I'm like, I, I, I could do with you being given a little bit more. A little more time in the oven? Yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But it, but the, the, the ingredients are there to continue your tortured metaphor. Um, but yeah, I thought it was effective, but it did kind of come out of nowhere and sort of shock me. In yeah. The end. I was like, ah, all right. Um, we moved swiftly on to a tag match. It's swiftly is a good word for it, yeah. considering who's involved. Because it's quick, because they're quick. Yeah, yeah they're, pretty, they're pretty fast. It's uh, champions Nathan Frazier and Axiom uh, against the OC of Gallows and Anderson. Um, and it was 
all OC in the early going. They're kind of honing in on Axiom's bad shoulder. The the story in this match was, for me, kind of like strength versus speed. Mm -hmm. How are the champions going to use their size disadvantage to wriggle out of the well-oiled tag team offense of the OC? Um because they keep trying to do it, but the OC sort of shut them down. Uh, OC get a bunch of double teams in to sort of no avail. Um, they're again using speeds and dives to get their momentum back. It's off to the outside, back in. Uh, Anderson hits like a TKO at one point that was pretty cool. Um, at, one, at one stage, Nathan goes out to do a dive onto uh, uh, Gallows, who catches him mm -hmm. and does a choke slam onto the apron and that is sort of distra distracting to axiom who's on the top rope which allows for uh anderson to get under the top rope and hit a, a super tko kind of thing uh gets a near fall um anderson goes to the top again but fraser manages to make the save this time which is the opening for axiom to hit a big spanish fly off the top and then fraser gets a phoenix splash and they ultimately escape with the pin i'll be honest i think this might be the best gals and anderson match i've ever seen Ever, I can't think of a better one. It's so interesting because I feel like Gallows and Anderson are. Uh, I I have a lot of energy for them as a presence, mm -hmm. uh, and the weight that they carry with being, you know, Bullet Club, and that that I'll never forget that. Even as a non New Japan fanatic, that day we found out that Shinsuke and the OC were coming over. Yup. It, it was like, this is going to be ma massive. And then that Raw After Mania where they debut and and it's, it felt big deal. It was one of the many 2016 big deals that, yeah. <laughs> that came and went without providing the deal. Um, but even then, you know, if they go off once they were quite cruelly released in the middle of a pandemic after signing a massive new contract, doing a decent-ish run with TNA and, in, and AEW being a part of that kind of crossover sure. was kind of fun. Um but and and then yeah, their, their return where they've kind of been bit part players. It's interesting to sort of see a, a, a reminder of them. Yeah, a little bit. It's one of those things, you know. Like, I, at one point, I really would go to bat for Carl Anderson, the the pro wrestler, you know, because like you know, former G one Climax finalist mm -hmm. has had really good matches. At one point, was like. He was second in command of Bullet Club. You know, there were people, you could argue Carl Anderson was a leader of Bullet Club. I wouldn't be one of those people, but, like, you know, he was the machine gun. He's Everyone's the, the leader of Bullet Club or something. No. Apparently. Especially no. Stop it. <laughs> but, you know, Carl Anderson was was a guy at that point. Mm. You know, he, he, was, he was a somebody. And sort of over the course of many, many years, that was kind of eroded away. You know, whether it was, you know, the OC just kind of becoming one of the teams in the mix after that first initial run in WWE didn't really go anywhere. To see them then leave and come back, and Carl Anderson does the bit in New Japan where he's, you know, the never champion. I thought his match with Tamatonga at Wrestle Kingdom was not good. Mm -hmm. And I was like... Maybe that's that those days are just behind us. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is like, oh, they've gone back to WWE, but also Carl Anderson's still got a foot in the door in New Japan, and maybe he's just content to get his big pa paychecks and fair play to him. You know, he, they could be back up for AJ Styles and do a fun thing with the Judgment Day. That's cool. To see this then be like, no, they are still motivated. Mm. They are still able to go down. And this, to me, is a perfect example of what NXT should be. Right. You take a team that's got some pedigree, that's never going to win the tag titles on the main roster in all likelihood, and they go down and they have a really good tag title match on a big show with your young, hot, fast team. You can't ask for much more than that. Yeah. I can... uh, I've been trying to think of a better Gallows and Anderson match off the top of my head, and I can't think of one. Mm, I would defer to your greater knowledge as well, because you've got the, the Japan yeah. credentials that I simply do not. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I thought, it was, I thought it was good. For me, this was probably the weakest match of the night, primarily because I felt it was... Um, I don't agree with that at all. You know, well, hang on. Uh, uh, yeah, I forgot what's next. Um, I don't agree with that at all. I, I, I think this, is, this might be my match of the night. Really? Yeah. It, it's so interesting because I, I, I liked it. Don't get me wrong. Like I said, there was nothing on the show that I didn't like. Um, I just thought it was kind of... I think maybe it's because I knew the outcome was going to be I enjoyed it and didn't enjoy it much further than that. Sure. If that makes sense. But like I, I, I love that you did. Yeah. Like, it was just like I really am a big fan of Nathan Frazier. 
Yeah. You know, and like I'm glad that I feel like I can have a bit more confidence in him being handled well. Jury's still out, you know, main roster, still with small guys, kind of 50-50, you know. Uh, yeah. However, like when he didn't sign with AEW years ago when he was Ben Carter and then went to NXT UK instead, I was like, well, there's the rest of your career gone there, mm. buddy. Like, what were you thinking? You know, to go to NXT UK in the pandemic era? Like, that ship had sailed. Mm. But then he comes over to NXT and eventually gets paired with Axiom and they have this really good tag team formation. And now I'm like, okay, he's getting to wrestle often in big matches. He's a champion on the show. And I have a little bit more faith that when he gets called up, you know, maybe because there's a Seth Rollins connection, he'll have a built-in feud ready to go there with the main event guy. There's a lot to be done with this really talented fellow. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel so much now that, like, oh, he should have signed with AEW and, yeah. and all that, that I certainly did then. Well, it's I really like him, and getting to see him show out is, is really encouraging. It's a different prospect now, isn't it? The whole doing, landscape's you know. different. But, yeah, so here you go. If you, if you tune into these reviews because you want to hear what we have to say and you don't necessarily want to have to watch the whole show, apparently watch this one. I'll watch it again. Yeah. I feel like I'm, I've missed a trick. Because I I liked it, I just didn't love it in the way you did, which is and to say much of the night is quite high price. Mm -hmm. um, what was not match of the night um, was <sighs> uh, Lola Vice versus Shayna Baszler in the NXT Underground. Now Earth insane... is a flat circle. We just watch these stupid raw underground things on the Wrestle Talk main channel, and it's still here haunting me. Now I so I I did a little catty shady joke in the intro to that which i think i i don't think this was anywhere near as bad as the shade i did suggested i think this was actually actually fine um i think nxt underground and raw underground are almost entirely different prospects yes and i think that the the natalia lola vice one from a couple of weeks ago was great i think it was sure. really fun yeah. um i think it was a, a refresher for natalia i think it was a refresher for Shayna baszler so it's nice that that's continued here for um Lola and Shayna, I heard your little sniff. I'm not going to follow on it. Um, I'm just still a bit ill. Okay, it's not Natalia's shade. I no, see. I. It's not her fault. That She's Canadian she had, Tempest. She had a flatulence problem at one point. Oh, God. Oh, they've. Really, she's been there so long. So long. Um. Anyway. So, uh, underground rules are there's no ropes. There's no count out. It's knockout and submission only, and it must happen on the map. Um, it is the story. The story going into this is kind of like Lola Vice has used Shayna Baszler as her second in that match against Natalia, but Shayna doesn't really approve of Lola dancing. She's like, sure, all fists, no twists, um, to coin a phrase. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why they've kind of and she's like, I'm going to remind you who I am, kind of thing. All work, no twerk. And this is e nice, nice, yeah, good. Um, it's all sort of hammer fists and scrappy attempts at various holds. Baser suplexes Vice into an ankle lock, but uh, Lola manages to send Shana to the post, get a rear naked choke in. They're brawling on the outside and on the table. Shana goes for a knee strike, but Lola moves, uh, and Shana crashes into the table. So Vice kind of takes advantage of that and uses it as a bit of a knee bar around the ring post kind of thing. It's very scrappy, fighty, back and forth. Um, at one point, Shayna kicks Vice in the head and sets up the Kirifudu clutch, but in that, Lola's wrenching the weakened knee to force Shayna to break the hold. They end up back outside where, for one reason or another, Shayna starts battering the lumberjacks uh, and then manages to get a triangle choke in, but Vice is on the outside, so she goes to pick her up. She's sent headfirst into the steps, roll back into the ring where Vice hits a back fist and some hammer fists, and then the ref stops the match. Um... I would like to open this by talking about how not everything has to be for everyone and style. That's wrestling. a great point, Dan. Because I, so you over the weekend, over the weekend, the story sort of broke that Ricochet is, has politely let it be known that he's probably not going to resign his contract when his mm -hmm. contract is due. And because of comments that Will Ospreay has made that uh, if I was a bad faith person, I'd make jokes about it being contract tampering, but uh, I'm not, so I won't. <laughs> what I will no, do instead... No, instead it's just running from the grind. What I will do instead is troll my friend on Twitter, uh, because you tweeted a uh, clip compilation from their match in New Japan. That has since been taken down. I Thank saw you, New that. Japan. Uh, in like 2016, wasn't it? Where yeah. it kind of lit the internet on fire at the time. And it's it's very um, aerial, athletic flip, whether it be like, a, I'm going to give you a head scissors and you're going to flip out of it, or 
we're going to go for a sort of double handspring and then we'll land in our superhero poses kind of thing. Uh, and you were like, we're going to run that back in the summer. I replied with what I was very proud of was a, a little joke about how I love the gymnastics at the Olympics as well. It's the Olympics this summer. Simone Biles is going to get the gold. And I picked specifically, Tempest, a gif where Simone Biles is, is on the mat that's the same color as the New Japan mat. That very was my good. favorite. I did that for you specifically. I wanted to I show you I appreciate the attention to detail. And obviously I'm trolling you and we're mates, so we're kind of allowed to, to play with that. But Yeah, everybody else was like, oh, I had to turn this off 10 seconds in. I don't like flippy shit. But I, I just mute them. <laughs> this is the, but this is the point that I then want to I want to raise, which is that like you might not like that style of wrestling. Mm -hmm. That might not get your goat. But for other people, it really, really works for them. Similarly, I, I don't I don't love it. On the other end of that, I don't watch real combat sports. Like, I don't watch MMA. Sure. I don't watch boxing. I don't really get much out of seeing people actively try and batter each other's heads in. So when we have a match like this, which is no flips, no athletic aerial maneuvers, it's all hammer fist trying to get a hold, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Even in a, a worked shoot place like this or whatever, to butcher some insider terms, I don't fully get loads out of it. That doesn't necessarily mean it, it is wrong or bad. And I have seen some positive responses to this match as, as well. It just means it doesn't fully connect for me. Do you know, this, do you see the comparisons I'm making? I, I absolutely do. These are kind of two opposite ends of a spectrum yeah. in that sense. Um, it's, I'm really glad that you did bring up that not everything has to be for everyone because I do want to just be like, okay, whatever. Because I have made it known in lists and such over the last year that if there is one thing that I hate in bell to bell wrestling, mm. it's worked MMA. Right. Yeah. I can't stand it. It's bad every single time. Whether it's Shayna and Ronda rolling around for however long at SummerSlam last mm -hmm. year, or whether it's Jake Hager and Wardlow doing an MMA fight on Dynamite and one of them does a shoot Hurricane Rana. I I'm never going to get it. Mm -hmm. I think most of the time, it's quite bad. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is about specifically worked MMA that makes me go like, oh, well, there's a real submission. She'd tap in half a second. Right. Whereas Shawn Michaels can sit in the ankle lock at WrestleMania for three straight minutes and not, you know, and walk out the next day on Raw. Yeah, right. You're in an ankle lock. You're going to tap in three seconds. You know, I whatever. That being said, I just found it very difficult to watch this match. I think in terms of worked MMA, it's probably on the better end of things mm. that I've seen. Like, I didn't watch it and just like sit there with a scowl on my face by any means but i am watching it and at like six different points someone has a mount and is just beating the yeah. piss out of them and i'm like why why is the match over they clearly can't defend themselves there's one bit where they're covering up like this and i think shana was just beating on her over like that's the that's the finish and when you turn that around and go five more minutes and then just have the finish be that but this time, it actually, yeah. I'm like, okay, whatever. No, I, I just get get on with it. I'll watch something <laughs> else that I like. If you enjoy it, more power to you. But this is not for me. I, compl I I'm I'm with you, and I think the reason is that we uh, wrestling is all about suspension of disbelief because obviously it's it's predetermined. There are simple things like if I get thrown into the ropes, I'm going to hold on. Why would I bounce back at you? Like yes. all of that stuff where we just the 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 ankle lock example is a great a great one. Like you know. It's there to heighten the drama. It's storytelling. Yes. It's performance art, all that stuff. Um, so then, when you have something in where it's like, okay, this one, this one's underground. This one's where there are blah blah this this, and, and it kind of creates a dissonance, I think, a little bit. Yeah. Um, some people really get it. I think actually, if you do this, this match went about ten minutes or so. I think if you made this match five, probably wouldn't have had as much of a, an issue. Yeah. I love. As I said, I liked the Lola Vice Natalia one. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was because it was more wrestling than scrappy. I I don't like MMA. I don't know if that's another prejudice I have going in. Not everything has to be for everyone. I do this like one, MMA, right. and this does nothing for me. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I donn't really thought about that. I I I tell you what I like. I like that it has taken Lola Vice for me from someone who comes out and does some Dancing with the Stars and mm -hmm. won the breakout tournament and I never for one second believed she was going to be NXT Women's Champion. And it's given her a bit of an edge. This 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 run with Shane and Natalia, the two underground matches, have made me go, when you do your hair like that, I feel like you're going to 
batter a person. Sure. And in the storyline character driven element of wrestling, that really is quite effective. Um, just in this match, for one reason or another, didn't vibe. Um, but hey, I hope it did for you. Um, we'll go over to the North American title triple threat match, which for me was a massive success. So it's kind of like a, a complete pivot. Uh, it's Oberfemi defending against Joe Coffey and Wes Lee uh, in a lovely little triple threat. The challengers are trying to take the giant champion down to begin with. Sort of sending to the outside so they have a better shot against each other. Lee hits some hard strikes on Coffey and dives over to Femi to keep him on the outside. And he hits like a diving twist off the top onto Coffey for two that's broken up by Femi. Femi shows off because he's big and strong and fast. He sort of does like a double suplex on the pair of them. And then just for a while runs and squashes them into the corner back and forth. Um, and then uh, <laughs> picks up Lee and just like lawn darts him at Joe Coffey, which is... Very cool to see. Uh, the numbers game catches up to the champ for a minute before uh, Wes tries a top rope move, which, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, he, he kind of goes for a top rope move on Femi. Femi decides he doesn't want that and again launches Lee into Coffee. Coffee keeps the champ on the outside and uses power moves on Lee for a little while. The crowd start chanting, we want tables. And I, I roll so hard at that, I give myself a migraine. Um, because why would you chant, we want tables in the middle of this? It was pretty good for what it was. And yeah. We don't need tables anywhere. And uh, it's also not a tables related i i could understand chanting it during the ladder match but not here um joe coffee manages to get over femi on his shoulders which is a pretty impressive thing i mean he's a unit is joe coffee but he kind of can't capitalize on it because the champ is just too big so lee does this big springboard stomp kind of thing which allows for coffee to hit a driver lee hits him in the face coffee falls on him gets a near fall um and then we arrive at the part where i lean forward and start giggling with absolute glee because on the outside uh, joe coffee goes to send over femi into the post but femi boots him down hits a pop-up power bomb onto the apron that looks like it would like sort out my back issues because mm -hmm. it folds me in half and then out of nowhere in the top corner of the screen wesley has gone for this kind of like flipping sent on dive over the top rope Obafemi just catches him. Yep. He just catches him. He barely moves. Lee's like hanging down. So he lifts him up and sends him launching into Joe Coffey. And I wanted to give this real shout out because it was all about the timing, the awareness and the placement of all three of them to do this safely. Mm -hmm. for, for the trust that Wesley shows in Obafemi, the strength and the power and that kind of core standing. And then he's kind of completely blind. So he's throwing Lee, hoping that Joe Coffey's going to be there. Yeah. And he is. Joe Coffey's there in the perfect time that when you watch the replay makes it look like he just stood up and turned into it. So that kind of awareness for the three of them, I think, was massively effective. I was really enjoying this match at this point. Um, and then the wheels fell off a little bit for me because Gallus come out to interfere and, and kind of take out Femi. Coffey hits the moonsault, sends him to the corner for a near fall. Femi sort of does that stand up behind Gallus shot where he's like, oh, oh, the monster's woken up. There's the Keith Lee with Finn Balor shot. Yeah. The, the great, the, that great gif. The uh, Drew McIntyre one. Yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. Taker pops out of the back. Um, so that allows for, for Wesley to get a bit of momentum, hits the cardiac kick, but Gallus pulled the ref out, so he dives on them. Femi throws coffee around with these. Lee goes to hit like a diving meteora, but Femi catches him, flattens him with a slam, pop a powerbomb on coffee. I was winded. Oba Femi gets the win. Oba Femi's one of my new favorite wrestlers. He's real good, this yeah, he's guy. He's real, real good. This is the thing where, like, I don't feel like a lot of his matches that I've seen have been, like, you know, this blow away five star affair or anything like that. Some, like, you get a match like this where I think it's great, you know, and it helps that you have, uh, like, a third dance partner in there to. It, it's tough when you've got one guy who's this immovable object to then have a fast paced match with him. You know what I mean? It's not impossible, but if you add a third person in there that can add or just, you know, up the average speed of the tempo of the match, I think it helps. In this case, my God, I was just watching this man and I was like, I get that there is still teaching to be done. Yeah. But he, he'd, he'd be in the main event of WrestleMania <laughs> <laughs> next year if I had the book. Like, I'm looking at him. And he's so interesting. He's so, he's got such an interesting build. Yeah. And every everything about him is so unique that he's like the kind of guy where it would like I don't know, it would take four of the Teen Titans to take him out. Mm. You know? He's a he's a brute in the sense where if you're playing like I don't know, Gears of War or something like that, he's not a giant like a a Satnam Singh or a Great Khali or a yeah. Big Show or anything. He's just a normal man 
that's somehow got twice the mass. Right. You know? Yeah. He's incredible. Like when I was watching all these different spots and whether it's Wesley doing the dive to the outside and getting caught or going for the me- the meteora at the end mm-hmm. where he just went and jumped onto his shoulders and he just like didn't move. He just caught him. It's like, nope, yeah. you're screwed, sir. You have come into my clutches and then you must die. There's something about this presentation, mm-hmm. this this package. And like, he's not even that like that interesting of a character. I he's was just literally about to say. He's just got so much physical charisma, and mm-hmm. his presentation as a pro wrestler is so unique and, and captivating. It's kind of what I was saying about Lola Vice in a weird way, where you're right, there isn't much character on Hypothermia at the moment, you know, but it kind of doesn't matter because doesn't really, matter. I, I when when the bell rings, I want to see what he's gonna do. And with Lola Vice, it was that thing of like adding an element to her where all I'm looking for in my wrestlers is a belief that when the bell rings, I want to see them wrestle. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to see what they're going to offer. I want yeah. that mouth watering prospect. And he has that in spades. And what I, I, I genuinely can't put over enough the confidence and the level of assurance he must give to his opponents mm-hmm. to be able to do the things that they were doing here. The ladder match that you were making reference to at the beginning has to be agented in such a way that avoids injury. Yeah. Certain moves here, like, I'm going to do a, a dive over the top rope and land on your shoulders, and you're going to catch me, and I'm not going to land on my head and break my neck. I've been injured recently. I'm going to do that. Can you keep me safe? Obafemi says yes. Then will you throw me at my opponent who you won't be able to see? Yes, I can do that. Now I'm going to do a meteor on you and I'm going to catch you and you're going to slam me and I'm going to be safe. Yeah, right, I'll do that as well. Yep. I mean, it just is this thing of a, a, a level of ability and a level of trust and a level of skill that I should, it shouldn't go underlooked. You know, I'm massively impressed by the pair of them. This is a top tier prospect. Yeah. A five tool player, as they say in the old baseball. A five tool player? Yeah. It's, what, it's, what are the tools? Uh, let me see if I can quote Moneyball off the top of my head. Oh, I haven't seen it in years. Uh, you gotta hit. You gotta hit with power. You can run. Uh, you can field, and you can do something else. Ah, of course. Well, I think Obafemi can do something else. He can do a little bit of something else. <laughs> He's so- God he damn it! Is something else. Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. Those Great. are the five tools. <laughs> okay, good. Um. And then we have the uh, women's uh, title match, which we spoke about earlier on. Backstage, Sexy Red and Lola Vice twerk. And they have the interviewer join them in the twerking. Did she, though? I was very uncomfortable. And I am also old. Um, Listen. This is something I never thought I would see on a WWE program. Never? Never. Even in HLA? Even then. You wouldn't see women with this much talent. (laughs) Listen. All due respect to everybody who who has ever tried to shake their ass on WWE. Oh, that kind of talent. That kind of talent. I understand. Eve Torres made it her her taunt for a while. She would just shake her ass. Who else did? A number of people, I'm sure. Who did the the moonsault? Oh, it was Naomi. Yeah. My goodness. Listen, it's a talent. We'll be taking a short break while Tempest goes for a cold shower. Um, uh, meanwhile, further backstage, Gallus jump Wesley. Wes is a bit cross about losing. and then It's Gallus really weird. Him. He was doing a, an interview like with the camera person. This was like a backstage uh, digital exclusive interview. It yeah. Like that ended up on the main show. Um, one of those weird NXT quirks that I hope doesn't make it to the main roster. Yeah. We're, ju- we're just getting to the point where I'm interviewing you and then hang on, I've got to run over here. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go back to... Yeah. Not only invisible camera, but also invisible interviewer. That doesn't yeah. really work for me. Um, and then it was time for our main event, which is another thing that I'm really interested to talk to you about because it oh, is I'm again to talk about it as well. Two weeks into Ethan Page's uh, arrival here under the WWE umbrella, it's Trick Williams in his first title defense, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I believe so. Versus all ego Ethan Page, uh, who signed a contract five days ago, and. Um, they're making a big deal about how you don't just walk into a company, sign a contract, and demand a world title match within five five days. That's massive. It's kind of huge. They're making it seem like this huge, big prospect. And Paige does get out of the, the blocks pretty fast. Um, 
it, William sort of misses with the kick and, and crashes to the floor where Paige sends him crashing into the steps, like fully face first. That Those steps go miles. <laughs> he really takes that well. Um, Ethan Page gets a double underhook backbreaker for two, keeps working over the ribs, trick gets some momentum back, spinning DDT, kicks Page in the face for two, running knee in the corner, gets a two for Page. So it's back and forth again in that regard. Uh, there's a section where they're sort of slugging it out on their knees. Uh, trick hits a rock bottom Aranagi situation. Also for a two, they end up back on the outside where he sets up the announce table only to get put through it himself. Back inside, Ethan Page hits the razor's edge for a near fall, which he is infuriated by, so he starts battering Trick in the corner. The ref pulls him off to avoid a DQ finish, so Ethan Page kind of gets in the ref's face for a little bit. as like, no, why are you doing this? I am Ethan Page. Uh, which allows for Trick to get back to his feet. Page turns around and is hit by the Trick shot, and Trick gets the four and if it sounds like i've rattled through that match quite quickly it's because the match felt like it, it was maybe like quite eight minutes i um i think it was i think it went 12 i'm baffled by this match yeah a little bit i <clears throat> i'm gonna lay my stall out on the table please i was sat down watching this match going into it thinking well this is interesting because i don't see trick losing and then i thought it would actually be really interesting and make something of a statement if you had ethan page win the belt and the longer i went i was like i think there's a real case here to have someone show up become the nxt champion in five days they're really selling this thing that he just signed a contract he's demanded this he's all ego and really cement this figure who's mm -hmm. taken out part of um metaphor and has had his business with them as well it's got into trick's head give trick the opportunity to get even more over as a baby face trying to get it back kind of thing i thought there was a real opportunity to do it here so when ultimately not only does trick retain but in a almost a cheap way using the a ref's flash advantage, finish and then the match itself was just super quick i was a, i was just baffled by the choice here i think a choice to keep to allow trick to retain is fine you know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to fantasy, fantasy book myself out of a good time, but it was this. It was the speed and the method of doing it that left me feeling a little bit underwhelmed. I think that's very fair, and I think your thoughts on this match and everything probably uh, just by the sounds of it circle around the the, the storyline reason for the the type of finish, given everything that we've seen from Ethan Page in NXT thus far. My thoughts on it are much more to do with, like, the quality of the match mm -hmm. and the presentation uh, as a result. Um, for, first things first, like, everybody kind of knows that Trick Williams is still green. Yeah. You know? It's not really a secret. But when you're that over, you can't push him, and that's what... This is the you problem, know. you know? And I, don't, I say problem liberally, because it's not a problem to have a guy as over as Trick Williams. He's got... Main event of the main roster level charisma and aura. He's not there yet in the ring. He's not there. Yet. He's getting there. He's got. He's got the potential to be yeah. there, but he. It's a process. Therefore, if you're going to be NXT champion in the main event of a premium live event, you need someone opposite you that can get you there, or you need someone able to do that with the help of an agent producer whoever who's going to build this match in a particular way to make it as interesting and creative and, and exciting as possible i don't know if they just didn't do that or i'm not sure that ethan page is just not that guy right ethan page is the other half of this because i'm willing to give trick williams like the uh, giving him a pass yeah because he is the guy that's in developmental because he should be in developmental yeah. and he's learning and he's getting better and that's what it's there for that's and the process working when you've called up in quick succession, Ilya Dragunov, Kamala Hayes, and Bron Breaker, you are a fool if you don't put the guy who everyone makes the camera bounce when they see him win, your top champion. Sure. So, like, you know, he's kind of in in the spot he's supposed to be and getting better. That's the idea of all of it. And in that regard, I think that's working. I don't think this match worked. And Ethan Page has some allegations about him mm -hmm. that might not be that exciting of a wrestler. And he had, I think, quite a bit of hype coming into him when he arrived in AEW, having left Impact, being part of the North and such. Great tag team. And then he fell down the card, fell down the card, never really did much 
in AEW. He had his things, men of the year, American top team, whatever. The firm, need I say more. By the time he had left, you had the Ethan Page fans saying that AEW had squandered Ethan Page, and you had the other section of the fan base going, squandered what? Right. Because he goes out there and he has matches, and they're fine, and he goes and he cuts the same promo all the time and he screams. Mm -hmm. He is one of those, I should be getting all the opportunities because I'm the best, type wrestlers. And that is not a particularly interesting archetype for me as a viewer. Yeah. And clearly was not interesting enough to get to that point otherwise. He shows up in NXT, and I'm not going to get into any of the tribalist whatever, whatever, because you're going to get stupid people from both sides. Anytime somebody leaves and goes to the other place, who are going to pretend that they're all, they've always been this big fan of them. And similarly, you're going to get people on the other side saying that they always sucked. Mm -hmm. I don't care about any of those, those groups of people. Cause they're all just, it's all just noise. Mm -hmm. That doesn't matter. However, I do think there's a real evaluation of this guy to be had. And I don't want to make it seem like he's dead in the water or anything like that. Or that, one s mediocre main event match can't be turned around with, you know, better matches to come. But I felt like this match was a potential time to be like, this is why you should have pushed Ethan Page. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see any reason for it. I think that's, I think that's a fair response, honestly. I don't, I, I don't think that you can judge him on this and i think it's i think to your point earlier it's an agenting thing i get all of what you're saying and maybe i'm just like maybe i'm more give it a couple months or whatever but you're right this was an opportunity and and again coming off this the same sort of level of hype as jordan grace that that nxt felt like a massive moment a big statement and that it was Taking someone who, yeah, I, I kind of hadn't really given much thought about over an AEW, and then he mm -hmm. pops up in NXT, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting, and he's going straight into the main event picture. What are we going to do with him? This was a real opportunity on a to for, for him to showcase what he has, and I think he showcased a, a, a perfectly decent wrestler. That's totally fine. Yeah. That's not a main event. Yes. And I think that's where that problem kind of lies. Like... There's so many different things that would make for a larger podcast topic mm -hmm. when it comes to this sort of thing. Like, if you are someone who was in a position that Ethan Page was in in AEW, absolutely, leave and go to the other place. Maybe it just takes a, a slight change and a little bit to click or a new environment or whatever. Underpushed people on either side should take it upon themselves to leave and go to the other place if they think that greener pastures exist. Mm -hmm. That is the beauty of having more options in pro wrestling. That is why pro wrestling as a whole was in a very dark place for almost two <laughs> decades yeah. because there didn't, there wasn't that. Now we have it, and just the cycling through of new people, I think, is going to help tremendously. And even if one doesn't work out, others will. I don't want it to seem like Ethan Page can't turn it around with more weeks and months here. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at this match and it, first impressions are important and this is a bit of like a statement match like if he'd gone out there and had a four and a half star match with mm -hmm. this guy everyone would be like oh Ethan Page he should have been AEW world champion yeah right and maybe rightfully so if he had done that but he didn't yeah instead a perfectly decent yeah. wrestler had a decent match that was in the main event and maybe that's that idea or that theory being reinforced with this match, maybe it was just an off night. Mm -hmm. We will see as we move forward with his run in NXT and such. But I don't know. I'm not. If that's the first impression, I'm not going to go into the second one and be like, oh, well, let's see how this goes. I'm going to be like, okay. Uh, yeah, that's and that's that's it, isn't it? It's that difference between being like, chomping at the bit to see a person and being like how's this gonna go yep and that is uh 
a really tricky line to walk. I hope the best for him. I I, I want everyone to succeed. That 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 part, I completely agree. He's with you. Canadian, damn it! <laughs> More Canadian wrestlers succeeding. And I feel it's like, tough out here. I feel like to, exactly as you say. I couldn't echo you anymore. The idea of this industry needing all of these spaces for these people to go, so that because not everybody can be a world champion everywhere, and 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 can uh, you know it's that's uh, that is a whole other topic for a whole other space. Um, but on, on on the basis of this match, it was far from bad. It was fine. Fine but is fine a isn't perfect enough, word. Yeah, is it? Um, so yeah, that was. I, I guess uh, two weeks in though. Same with the TNA thing. It's it's to sum up Battleground as a whole. It felt like one of those really enjoyable NXT PLEs that is like, all right, let's see where we're gonna go with this going forward, rather than a big moment. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, yeah. yeah. I, I think it was a, it was a, it was a good show. I, I thought it was a, a perfectly fine little show. Yeah. I'd give it like a three out of five. I would never make a point of going back to the Apex, even though I know that they will because it's their uh, um, partnership with the sure. UFC or whatever. But uh, it, it was fine. Who's benefiting from this? Are um, they going to drive up UFC <laughs> pay per view numbers by having NXT at a UFC venue? Shows, it's Stupid. Who yeah. cares? I don't care that Forrest Griffin's in the crowd for NXT. Not everything's for everyone. I don't know who that is. <laughs> but then again, I feel like someone I know shows up in the crowd. I'm like, oh my god, it's Emma Darcy from House of the Dragon. And like, mm -hmm. some people might not know who Emma Darcy is. Like, that's yeah. fine. Um, anyway, yeah, that's the show. Yeah, that's the show. So, of course, let us know what you thought about NXT Battleground. Do you completely disagree with us about Ethan Page or Jordan Grace or the TNA crossover in general? Let us know the answers to all these questions down in the comments below. Make sure, of course, that you've given this video a thumbs up if you haven't already. And make sure that you subscribe to the WrestleTalk Podcast channel because we will be back. I don't, I say we, I won't, but Dan will be with Luke tomorrow on the Raw Podcast. And before I go, I want to once again shout out my wrestling pub quiz that I'm doing next Friday. Mm -hmm. It is June the 21st at Rule Zero in Hackney. I'm doing a pro wrestling pub quiz. I'm very excited about it. He's going to be there. Yeah. He's not going to be a Taylor Swift. I certainly I'm not. I'm, cr I'm crushing <laughs> it. No offense. No, I know. Uh, who can compete? But I'm very much hoping to see all of you there. It's going to be a very good time. There's going to be prizes, cash, drinks, all that good stuff. Plenty of members from the team that you will recognize and a very fun quiz to go along with it. So make sure that you get your tickets. The link is in my bio on Instagram. Make sure you go there. Tempest Likes Wrestling on Instagram and I will see you there. Until then, I've been Tempest and that's been Dan. That was NXT Battleground. Yeah.